In this video, we're going to talk about uh, control of local blood flow. Right? We've previously talked about regulation of blood pressure right? Uh, through changes in cardiac output, through changes in, in vascular resistance. Um, and those changes in vascular resistance are in this uh, video as well. But in this case, instead of it being sort of an broad control of vascular resistance to maintain blood pressure, here, and this is a balancing act your body does, here we're going to talk about regulating um, vascular resistance for functions of protection and meeting metabolic need, right? And so we've got to maintain blood pressure and, and total peripheral resistance is one of the factors that helps us do that, right? Um, blood pressure is the driving force for flow, but we also need to make sure that the blood vessels are helping to determine and aren't entirely passive in this uh, effect of maintaining blood flow to individual tissues to meet their needs as well as to avoid damage. And we'll talk about those things here. Right? Now, one of the things we, we need to um, jump into first because we're talking about this resistance to flow, right? And altering this resistance to flow. One of the problems we have is that our very small vessels, I'm looking up here in this graphic now, right? Our very small vessels have very high resistance, right? We talked about that before. Um, with our series resistance and our and our and the compensation for that series resistance. Remember, series resistance is when you know you go from a big pipe to a smaller pipe to a smaller pipe, right? And you add up the resistances of those individual pieces of the pipe, right? From aorta to brachial artery to radial arteries to you know, small arteries in your palm, palm of your hand, right, and so on, and we had also seen that <clears throat> the highest component, one of the largest components of resistance is actually in the smallest arterioles, right? We could actually call them the resistance vessels. And so uh, one of the factors that affects the resistance there um, is this thing called the Farius Lindquist effect. And again, so let's be clear, right? The very small vessels offer the highest resistance to flow and therefore make it the heart have to work higher, generate a higher pressure to maintain flow through those vessels, right? Yes, it was absolutely essential to have parallel vessels. In other words, have a, a network that branches, right? Where it branches outward like this, right? We go from one to two and from two to four and so on and so forth. Just keep going and going and going, right? That these parallel, right? If you get out here, right? We have all of these parallel pathways, where blood can flow through them, right? And that actually reduces resistance overall, right? Because remember, our total for a parallel system, and we have both series and parallel, but for a parallel system, our total equals the resistance of each vessel divided by the number of vessels, right? So the more vessels you have, the lower the total resistance. Okay, so we already have compensations for this fact that we have the little tiny vessels have this ridiculously high resistance. However, apparently that's not good enough. And, and this is just a physical factor because blood is this various Lindquist effect. Uh, <clears throat> it's just a physical factor, but it's very helpful. Um, but it's a fact, uh, a fa physical factor of the, of the uh, concept that blood is um, a colloid, what's called a colloid suspension, meaning it's cells suspended in a fluid as opposed to it just being like a liquid. And of course, you don't see that, at, you know, grossly. But, you know, you look under a microscope and you can see, well, there's a liquid component and there's a cellular component. Well, <coughs> excuse me. When blood flows through very small vessels, so look at our size here, less than a third of a millimeter, what happens is the red blood cells tend to align along the axis of the vessel. They sort of clump along the uh, axis of the vessel. And what this does, it, well, and couple things it does, right, uh, is the it reduces the viscosity of blood at the borders, at the wall. And viscosity, of course, is one of those factors that was in the resistance equation and therefore in Poisson's law, the expanded version of Poisson's law, right? And higher viscosity fluids flow with higher resistance, right? You don't really want high viscosity. And we have to have red blood cells. They're carrying all the hemoglobin, okay? So... 
how do we reduce, right? The red blood cells already increase the viscosity of blood by like almost threefold. So how do you minimize that viscosity effect? Well, the ferris lindquist effect helps us with that, right? And our, so you can see our relative viscosity here, right? As our vessel diameter gets, is large, or, right? Our relative viscosity is high, but look what happens here. We get into these little tiny, right? Here's the arterioles, right? Way down here. Look at this. Boof falls off a cliff, right? Our viscosity falls in these little tiny vessels because of this axial collection of the um, red blood cells as it flows through them, reducing viscosity and enhan therefore enhancing flow by reducing the resistance, right? Remember, lower viscosity means lower. And it's, it's weird because it's not viscosity overall, right? It's viscosity at the edges here, right? And it's why blood is said to have what's called anomalous viscosity, like strange viscosity, essentially. Because when it flows through little pipes, you get two different regions, right? You get the low viscosity regions at the border and a high viscosity region in the center. Okay, so the ferrous lindquist effect, absolutely essential to keeping the resistance of small vessels low so that we don't have to have a, a blood pressure that's much higher to maintain flow through them. Okay, that's helping us maintain flow. Now, how do we regulate that flow, right? What's keeping that flow matching need? And there's really two forms of what we call autoregulation. I've got them both here in these two uh, figures. We label this one figure one, and down here, this is figure two, right? And they, they revolve around a smooth muscle effect. That's number one. And then the number two, it's an endothelial effect, right? Which will affect the smooth muscle. But the first one is a direct effect of, on smooth muscle up here in one. And the second one is an indirect effect on the smooth muscle, regulating the dilation or constriction. But it's uh, mediated by the endothelial cells. So let's start up here at one. And, and one would, would be called the myogenic effect. And basically, what it says is that, right, we want auto-regulated auto flow. In other words, we don't want flow to change radically just because we increase our perfusion pressure, right? Our, our blood pressure is rising. Well, remember, pressure drives flow. So if blood pressure were to go up, right, we would end up actually having higher flow if it weren't controlled by something. And you might think, well, your blood pressure doesn't really change all that much, minute to minute. And that's true. However, is the perfusion pressure in your heart the same as it is in your fingertips? Hmm. R equals 8 L eta over pi R to the fourth. What's different between your heart and your fingertips in this equation? Right? Assuming the same size vessels, that the blood is the same, right? It's the length of the vessels, right? Some, some tissues are farther away from the pressure generating source, the heart. And so the perfusion pressure in your fingers is always differ, different than the perfusion pressures in your heart and must be compensated for, right? We can't just have lower blood pressure in your fingertips driving less flow to your fingers. Maybe your fingers need oxygen and nutrients as well, right? So we have to have this autoregulation, this myogenic autoregulation, right? whether your blood pressure is actually changing or just referring to two tissues that are at not the same distance from the, the pressure source, right? A larger pressure fall all the way to your fingertips than there is to the heart muscle. Okay, like coronary arteries, right? So what happens? Well, uh, yeah, let's start at A here, right? If you're in the middle here, right? And our perfusion pressure, pressure were to fall, right? We would want right? That would make flow go down, dry, lower, right? Q equals delta P over R, right? So if pressure were to fall, if delta P goes down, right? Driving pressure goes down, then flow goes down. Well, we don't want flow to go down. We want it to stay the same. So if our driving pressure falls, what do we need to do? We need to decrease the resistance, right? If we decrease the resistance, then we're pushing this back up again. Right, we solve our Q problem, okay? And that's this arrow right here, right? We would normally drop our flow because of that uh, 
that lower perfusion pressure. And the way to increase it is to dilate the vessel. So you can see as we go up here, the vessels dilate and then dilate even more, the lower our perfusion pressure goes. And of course, in the opposite direction, right? If our um, perfusion pressure were to, were to go up, our flow would tend to go up, but we don't want it to. So what pushes it back down? Constriction, right? If we constrict, then resistance goes up. If resistance goes up, then flow goes down, right? This Q goes lower and we maintain this flat auto-regulated auto blood flow. Great, how's it work? Well, in a vessel, right? Uh, let's just draw one within here. If in a vessel, right, we have a pressure and it pushes on the walls, pushes outward, right? That's called transmural pressure. And when that transmural pressure rises, right, as it would with an increase in perfusion pressure, it stimulates, vol uh, well, it stimulates just, um, uh, ion channels to open, which are going to lead to an increase in intracellular calcium in the smooth muscle, right? The rise in intracellular calcium leads to more constriction, right? Here we go from our moderately sized vessel to smaller and smaller, right? Go the opposite direction. Of course, the opposite, the transmural pressure falls, our intracellular calcium falls, which means the vessel will dilate more uh, at a given transmural pressure, right? There's more, there's less tension in the wall as we constrict less. Okay, great. So now we've got the myogenic effect, which is helping us maintain blood flow, even when the perfusion pressure might vary. Um, now, if we go over here to two, right, we've got an endothelial effect. And this is more related to shear than it is to pressure. So what's shear? <clears throat> shear stress is the linear force along a wall it's tending to pull on it, right? In other words, as blood flows along the inside of this pipe, there's some there's friction against the wall and it's tending to pull on those cells that line the inside of the vessel. Okay, well, that's just, that's, that's a physical fact, right? However, high shear, right? Lots of pulling is affected by two things. High flow, that just makes sense, right? It's gonna pull more if it's flowing quickly or high viscosity. Both of those things would tend to create greater shear and potential damage to the vascular wall. <clears throat> right, so where do we have high, high flow, right? Because viscosity, other than this anomalous viscosity that we were talking about with the ferrous Lindquist effect up here, but viscosity is relatively constant in, in all the larger vessels, right? Because hematocrit is relatively constant, right? But is velocity the same? Mm, go back to that previous slide, right, where we had velocity very, being very high in the aorta and then very low in smaller vessels where there was a much more cross-sectional area, right? Remember, velocity is proportional to one over the cross-sectional area, right? And so the aorta has a very small <coughs> cross-sectional area, which makes its velocity very high, right? Same thing with the larger veins. Um, Okay, so how do we get a protective effect there, right? Um, well, when shear is high, well, when is shear high and when is shear low first? Well, shear is higher in constricted vessels than it is in dilated vessels, right? Because the flow rate, um, even though flow volume per uh, second or minute would be less, the velocity is higher, right? proportional one over the cross-sectional area. So if the cross-sectional area goes down, then the velocity goes up. More velocity means higher shear. We don't necessarily want that. So how do we avoid it? Well, that high shear stimulates the endothelial cells to release something called nitric oxide, abbreviated NO. And nitric oxide diffuses to the adjacent smooth muscle cells, these guys over here, right? These set, uh, vascular smooth muscle cells surrounding the endothelium, the cells on the inside of the vessel, right? Highlight a couple of them in blue here, right? The endothelium lines the vessels. Well, they respond to the shear because they're up against the blood and they release nitric oxide, which acts on the smooth muscle, right? And of course they're going to change the, we're gonna, you know, through a couple of actions here, downstream actions, they're gonna change the calcium, uh, intracellular calcium levels.
And so high shear blocks influx of uh, extracellular calcium, right? Leading to less smooth muscle constriction and a dilated vessel. So our dilated vessel has lower shear. Now it will have higher flow, right? But it will have lower shear. Okay, and that's a protective effect, right? And, and nitric oxide is not the only thing that stimulates nitric oxide for sure, but that is one element of uh, how shear affects the endothelium and then the endothelium controls the smooth muscle to keep shear from uh, becoming dangerous, right? Because when shear is really high, you can get damage to the vascular wall and then you end up with, with um, cardiovascular disease where you get plaque formation and other things that will happen. Um, all those being bad, right? Now the last thing, right, which is not, it, it's auto, sorry, it's not auto regulation, it's local regulation. Uh, and that is exemplified by this. Shrink this a little bit. Right, and this is uh, active hyperemia. So what's going on in this in this uh, uh, slot, this uh, graph down here, is we've got flow rate, right, our tissue flow rate, right, going up on this axis, and then we have just time down here, right. We're we're causing some manipulations, and so here's our resting flow to a particular tissue. Again, affected by general blood pressure, affected by the myogenic effect, affected by the shear factors that are modulating the vascular tone as well. But then what's going to happen is we can do a couple different things here. We can either start exercising, right, where we're going to increase our flow rate. And then it's sort of like, well, how is it increasing? Or we could just sort of like pinch off that artery, right, uh, that, that, that vessel, and flow drops to nothing here, right? We squeeze the vessel and blocks off, but watch happens, what happens afterwards. It rebounds and it goes above our resting level, right? Here was our resting level. And that's called active hyperemia, like during exercise when it's responding in time to the change in metabolism. And reactive hyperemia when it, it can't respond because you've got the vessel pinched off, right? A, a, a obstructed essentially, put a ligature around the, you know, a fingertip or something like that, right? Um, and so, I mean, you get your blood pressure tech, uh, checked when they squash your brachial artery with a, with a blood pressure cuff. You're going to get a little bit of reactive hyperemia. What mediates this? Well, this is, this would be three, right, in our list of things. And this would be the metabolic control of resistance, right? Small vessel vascular resistance. And what types of things might be causing that to occur, right? Well, there's a variety of them. And they are the factors that are locally produced and there and have uh, vasoconstrictive or vasodilatory effects. So you can, you can list all sorts of things that are just purely logical here. What happens if O2 at a particular, in a particular tissue falls? What do you think, what, what effect do you think that has on the vascular smooth muscle? Do we want more flow or less flow to that tissue if O2 is low? Obviously, you want more. If we want more flow, right? Remember this guy here, right? The dilated vessel had more flow, had less shear, but it had more flow. Okay, that's what we want. So low O2 is a dilator. High CO2 is a dilator. Increased H plus is a dilator. Right? Ooh, think about that one. Increased H plus. Does a tissue become more acidic if its metabolism rises? Absolutely. Either because of lactic acid, we can actually put lactate down here as a dilator, right? But this CO2 is directly correlated with the H plus, right? Uh, CO2 is, it's not an acid itself, but it acts a bit like one because it, it become, combines with water to produce H plus, right? And so increase in H plus would be a dilator. Lactate would be a dilator. Increase in temperature tends to dilate vessels, right? Here's another one that I want to emphasize a little bit. Increased potassium hmm. in the interstitium now, right? 
Now we know potassium is a is the major cation inside of cells. When does it end up on the outside of cells in, in slightly greater concentrations? Well, when cells are doing a lot of repolarizing. Think about skeletal muscle, right? When skeletal muscle becomes active, lots of action potentials, lots of potassium efflux, right? So all of these things would tend to be dilators helping to match blood flow to local metabolic need. Right? Because all these things are indicating that metabolism is going up, meaning that there's more oxygen required, there's more nutrients required, there's more CO2 washout required, and so on and so forth. Right? Have all these things go in the opposite direction? Guess what? Constriction. Right? And of course, what we have in our graphic here is that during exercise, right, we get this active increase, active hyperemia, active increase in flow as all these factors change. If you constrict the vessel, right, then it has to happen sort of after the fact, after you release the vessel, but you'll get this rebound effect that'll take you above your resting level of blood flow to compensate for the time that it did not have blood flow. Okay, so lots of things going on there, right? We had our various Lindquist effect helping us maintain low resistance in our vessels, but then that we found that those that resistance was actually... Uh, labile, right? We can manipulate it. And we had one and two, right? Or figures one and figures two here, where we had autoregulation, both myogenic in one, and two through nitric oxide uh, induced by shear stress. Remember, that's largely protective. And, and, and again, NO, guess what? NO is, is increased in response to exercise. Haha, -ha, it's a dilator again, in that case, being a metabolic controller of resistance. The example I gave you down here was when it was stimulating response to shear, which of course is also true. Okay, and then you know finally in, in three we showed all of these factors, uh, metabolic factors that will affect blood flow. Right? Don't memorize them; they are all logic. As metabolism goes up, these are logical effects to the local environment. Right? And of course we want more blood flow, which makes them all vasodilators. Okay, there's even another one I can throw it on here. Just, it, just for logic, right? Adenosine, right? Guess what? Adenosine is a byproduct of ATP metabolize, uh, uh, metabolism, right? So the more ATP you use, the more free adenosine accumulates. It's a vasodilator, right? Again, using ATP is an indicator that you need increased blood flow for aerobic metabolism. So adenosine is a dilator. Right? And we can go on and on. It's just some of them have more importance than others. Um, increase in potassium is a real big, strong one. Low O2 is a real strong one. Right? But anyway, uh, and that's not all that important, but it's important to understand how their logic is tied to changes in resistance and therefore flow. There we go.